Hey everybody, good morning. I am Missy Buck, president and founder of Miss Inc. I'm also an athlete, mental health coach, author, and all kinds of different things. I keep myself busy, but we're not here for me today. We're here for Marketing Monday, Monday if I could say my words, Marketing Monday. And I have Eugenio, but you prefer to go by Gino. Gino. <laughs> Jaramillo. Did I say it right? You got it. Yes. We we're practicing off air. I was a little nervous making sure that I could pronounce his name correctly. So, all right. Anyway, so we're here today. And guys, I think what you really need to know is that his nickname is the Purple Squirrel, right? One of the most interesting, you want to talk about the most interesting man. He might, this might be him. <laughs> So he has a book where it says all kinds of things. He claims that he's busier in retirement than he ever was during his working days. So we're going to find out all about that, how he became to be the purple squirrel and this amazing branding that he has around that and how he's built that. So um, with that, I'll let you introduce yourself. I know you have multiple titles in retirement. You're doing all kinds of things. So welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me, Magic <laughs> Misty. Oh, there we go. That's a new on one. Marketing Mondays. Yeah. My name is Eugenio Jaramillo, con el pelo amarillo. There you go. I know it's a tongue twister for many people, so I asked them to call me Gino. Uh. I consider myself a renaissance man because of all the things that I've done in my life. I started as a computer engineer, having graduated from University of South Florida as an electrical engineer. I worked in Sunrise, Florida, uh -huh. designing hardware, firmware, and software for about five years. Bored stiff, I left. Dad wasn't your thing. Wasn't my thing. Behind a cubicle all day and a computer. I need people contact. I'm yeah. a people person. No, I can't tell. Couldn't yeah. tell. Yeah. <laughs> Locked up in my cubicle. Dad retired. Grandpa left us some money. So we went and bought some real estate down south. It was oh. agricultural land. We turned it into single family home lots. And we built... 45 homes and sold them. Then the market crashed. There were some thieves that created the savings and loan crisis. You're probably too young to know what savings and loan is. Mm -hmm. Lost my two and a half million dollar line of credit. And sometimes you have to feed your family. So I started selling sometimes. knives. Oh, yeah. I sold knives for a little while and taught others how to do it. I don't know yeah. if anybody here got caught up into the, In the Cutco, Cutco Ver yes. Vector Marketing. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. very famous. Taught me some great skills. And I figured that that's that was kind of the beginning of my public speaking yeah road then in life it's not what you know but who you know my brother had followed Howard Snellenberger up to Louisville and it's okay. funny his name is Louis so Louis was in Louisville Louis in Louisville Louis in Louisville <laughs> and he had the kicker from UM who was known at that time as Flea a little uh, short uh -huh. guy great kicker he helped him, so, showed him all the ropes up there because they got the same degrees, a Master of Arts in Teaching. And Jeff moved back to Clearwater, where he was from. Uh -huh. And he knew this family called the Brown family and another man that was an investor that used to own like 20 some odd Wendy's. And he realized that a lot of the business he was getting was that they call off premise. So it was either drive through mm. or they come and pick up and they would leave. So he so created. Like they weren't going into the brick and mortar right. store. Uh -huh. they, would, okay. they would order. And he created this franchise called Checkers. So oh, we brought the first might checker. Have heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> we brought the first Checkers franchise to Miami. It's still sitting there today on Bird Road and 107th wow. Avenue. Did that for a little while, but the banks didn't believe me. They didn't know that this was the next great thing. Yeah. And in retrospect, they probably should have invested in their IPO. Uh, the well, public okay. offering instead of investing in the store. So I sold out to some partners during the time we were building the homes. I ran into my high school buddies and they were general contractors and they had a housing development going on near my housing development. So I hired them to build four of my homes, mm. just the shell part of it. And when I finished doing the stuff, the president of the company, my friend that I've known since high school, mm -hmm. Jorge, said to me, Gino, are you done flipping burgers, flipping knives, and flipping houses? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, come work for me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I don't know what you do. What do you guys do? We're commercial contractors, build schools, hospitals, jails, roads, bridges. 
I don't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. He said, don't worry. We'll train you. You will? Okay, I'll work for you. I started with them, and they did not train me. It was on the job, learn as you yeah. go, blow by blow, life happens to you. I started as an estimator. Uh -huh. We landed a whole bunch of work, and then I was a project engineer dealing with all the submittals and the RFIs and the change orders. And then one of the older brothers, the older brother, came from his jaunt out and in, by himself, and he came to join the company. And mm -hmm. he told the brothers, he said, hey, this guy would be more valuable out in the field. So let's send him out to a project. So they sent me to an elementary school. I became the project manager. And then that led me to a progression where I got bigger and bigger projects. I did the mental health facility at Jackson Memorial, $25 million project. And then I did some schools. I did some targets. Yeah. And then I finally landed at the airport. You landed, landed at, at the airport. So from flipping all over the place, now yes. you landed the airport. Okay, and you're and the project I, manager. I was project manager, then I was senior project manager, then I was a project executive for a joint venture. We did $255 million worth of work in about wow. five years. Super profitable, safe, high quality, and a satisfied owner. So I have a question though, yeah, speaking of being a satisfied owner, yeah. were you more satisfied because you had made this career pivot, you studied something in college, applied yourself, got a job, were working at it and thought this is not for me. And so you made that pivot. So making these pivots, were you more satisfied through this progression than you were earlier in your career in different industry? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Because it was turned out to be <laughs> almost like my calling because uh, I could do it. I could do it with ease. I had a passion for it. I could see the product that I was building, you know, yeah. software is something yeah. that you really can't see. You see a bunch of lines of right, code right, right. and you see the computer do something. But here I could actually see the building going up. It was very satisfying. Yeah, because you can see step by step, brick by exactly. brick, this is making a difference. We're accomplishing yeah. something. I mean, I'm painting the inside of my house right now and it's taking forever in a day because we're doing it in small increments. But I only say that because I can identify with, you know, like little, yeah little things happening. So that's amazing. Okay. So you're there. And I did not personally build the buildings. I directed what? teams. What? I thought you were the Renaissance man and could do but everything. I, I'm just uh, kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. All I can do is sweep and pick up trash. That's all right. But no, you did. So this I had awesome. teams. I uh -huh. had an awesome team of 35 people. Right. We completed successfully. Then I said, you know what? I'm bored um, again. And I want so to retire. So you mastered something. I want to retire yeah. early. So at 59 and a half, which uh -huh. is the magic number that you can pull all your 401k money out. Right. And Uncle Sam does not take 10%. Right. Rolled it over into a new IRA directed by me where I purchased part of a registered investment advisory. And so they're my money managers. So I was able to take my money out and manage it. And they told me, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't jump off a cliff. You got to go gradually to mm -hmm. retire. Be our consultant. I go, okay. And then I went and traveled the world <laughs> while I was their consultant. Yeah. And then I helped them land a job at Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, $125 million Eastern expansion of Terminal 4. And they said, you know, we don't have anybody that can run this work. Please, uh -oh. please, please, uh -oh. please, unretire. Come back. <laughs> unretire. Come back. I okay, said, Tom okay, Brady. I'm coming back. <laughs> but, yeah. Tom Brady before yeah. Tom Brady. Tom I retired. Brady. No, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I, I did the Tom Brady before Tom <laughs> well, Brady. Yeah, did you it. made that cool. <laughs> I said, okay, but you got to pay me all this money. And so I made them a deal uh -huh. that I couldn't refuse. Right. <laughs> they said, yes, I was their highest paid employee ran the project for about 16 months. I had the most competent, most reliable, highest paid team ever, 25 professionals working for me. And we got the highest rating. They made me the director of aviation construction, mm -hmm. overseeing all the aviation projects because they had one in Texas, they had one in Miami, and they had this Fort Lauderdale thing. And then one day they called me to lunch and I said, hmm, this guy that invited me to lunch was the youngest brother, and he never invited me to lunch. Mm -hmm. What's up? You ever have that feeling in yeah, your stomach yeah. like something's, like something's wrong? Of course, yeah. So I go to the lunch, and this other guy was there, and they said, Gino, we love you. You're a tremendous asset. You add value wherever you go, but 
we can't afford you we anymore. We can't afford you. We made mistakes by going to Texas and Panama and in South Florida. We made some blunders. Therefore, we have to ask you to go back to being a consultant. Mm -hmm. I was pissed. I was so mad after uh, working 25 years for them with loyalty and integrity right, and honesty. Right. And they just spit me out like a spitball. Mm -hmm. What I found out, that lesson, which is part of my book, is that your company owns your job, but you own your career. So it's up to you to take care of your career. Mm -hmm. And that's what I talk about in the book, about professional development, personal development. I did struggle for a little bit because you go through the five stages of bereavement that's mm -hmm. also in my book mm -hmm. so at first it was anger then there was denial no this can't be happening to me this is not real and then you bargain with god please god help me through this phase and i promise to be a good boy i'll go to church i'll pray more <laughs> yeah yeah i'll give to the poor and the needy and then you get into a depression and this one lasted quite a bit mm -hmm about three months remember it was 25 years of my life that i devoted to these folks and yeah. this company and then you get into acceptance so there was five brothers that owned and operated the firm and i accepted it by going to each brother and saying listen guys i get it it's your company it's your life it's your blood sweat and tears that you formed this corporation and i gave you my all and you know what i get it i understand it so i forgive you Mm -hmm. So by forgiving each brother one at a time, I was able to accept it and move on. Mm -hmm. And I moved on to continue with other things of my Renaissance man. So you heard engineer. I also got my MBA from the University of Miami while I was doing the real estate development, flipping burgers, flipping knives, <laughs> and flipping houses. Right. In the meantime, I had developed some medical conditions with my shoulders. So I went to see a regular doctor and he gave me a shot of cortisone in my shoulder and I was great. My next shoulder started giving me trouble. And I said, give me the shot, doctor. And he goes, no, there's contraindications. I go, mm -hmm. what kind of contraindications? The wind blowing across your wallet? Mm -hmm. We have to go through the steps. I said, no, thank you. I went and found an acupuncturist. The acupuncturist treated me. It was so awesome. She treated my soul, my spirit, my body. She's a clinical psychologist and a classically trained Chinese acupuncturist. Mm -hmm. She told me to lose some weight, which I did, and I started doing yoga. And in that meantime, I met some folks. I became a yoga junkie, and I started doing yoga yeah. all over town, and I started teaching it. I taught it taught at LA Fitness for like five years. Really? Yeah. That's super interesting. <laughs> Every Saturday I was there, and sometimes Wednesdays and Fridays. I also opened my own art gallery and studio in Doral because I love to tinker with objects, especially wire and found objects, I call them. Oh, so you I know, found. I have a little yeah. tree that Brent gave me. We yes. have a mutual friend, Brent Huffman. Shout out to you, Corporate Safety Solutions. And yeah. He gave me this beautiful tree that you made that matches yeah. the branding of my business. That's made out of telephone wire mm -hmm. that I found at Miami International Airport. And That's then the little bottom cool. of it is. The, piece of a branch no trees were killed the <laughs> it, was tree. <laughs> it was already down some hurricane some storm took it down Thank you for clarifying that. and i made that little That's, thing yeah they're I, super I've, cool i've made thousands of things yeah I, I, it's it's like therapy you it's don't like, have one with you too bad right no, oh they're bad. super cool yeah. it's almost like knitting so i can do it watching tv or yeah, watching yeah. one of my favorite shows and i don't even have to look it's just the digital and manual dexterity that I have and it's very relaxing yeah. and I love giving them away to people they enjoy them so much and it brings them my good energy and my good karma yeah so I think we've covered almost everything except for that I discovered Toastmasters International about eight years ago yeah I was going to ask you about Toastmasters so this okay. is actually how I was introduced to you initially to the legend of the purple <laughs> through toast not that I have not involved with Toastmasters <laughs> but my very good friend Brent is and he always talks about you and you're his mentor and um, you're helping him with crafting, speaking and, and all kinds of other things. I know you guys are giving workshops together now, yeah. like you're doing, you're like this dynamic duo, right? Just all over the place, full of energy. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I was in, so I wanted to ask you about that. I was super curious because a lot of people know what Toastmasters is. And if they don't, I'm sure you're going to tell us right now. Let's do it. Here's what happens. Toastmasters International 
is the largest, oldest organization that a lot of people have not heard of. Yeah. It's in 149 countries <clears throat> worldwide, organized by clubs, then areas, then divisions, then districts. There's over 100 districts in the world. And every language is covered. And it was started in the 1920s by a man named Dr. Ralph Smedley that was helping young men grow up to be professionals and leaders so their tagline is where leaders are are built but it's really about public speaking and it's also about listening mm -hmm. so there's listening skills because we check your grammar we check your filler words like um ah uh, er ah uh, um and you know and like i'm very guilty of and things. literally <laughs> it's my all favorite. those things guilty. <laughs> so i've been at it for eight years and in my first 39 months as a member of the South Dade Club, which is right around the corner from here, I achieved the highest educational award, which is called Distinguished Toastmaster, DTM. Okay. I came back from one of their conventions, which are wildly cool. People from all over the world, 2,000 people, all like-minded individuals trying to improve themselves and improve their public speaking and leadership skills. And I come back inspired to not only get my DTM, but to change the acronym to Devoted to Mentoring. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done now, being a member of several clubs. Right now we're at Doral Toastmaster, Brent and I, and we mentor people to become better speakers, better leaders, and better listeners. Right, so what drew you to that? Because I know a lot of people, this is a show about marketing after all, and yeah. a lot of people are afraid of public speaking. Oh yes. Um, I can't, you know, I, we also, I also run a social media agency and to get people to do even a video on their phone, they're very uncomfortable with that. Some are more uncomfortable with that than speaking in front of an audience. It's interesting. But so There's we know actually, that's one of the top fears in the world. Yes. So what drew you initially to Toastmasters before you decided to take the evolution of being a mentor and all of those things? What you just spoke about, 75% of the public feels some kind of anxiety before they speak right. in a group. And it's called glossophobia. Glossophobia. I did not have glossophobia because I had trained college students to do the vector marketing thing mm -hmm. and i was a teacher for a while which i didn't speak about that i'm, I'm an adjunct professor at three different universities yes, right we now haven't even gotten to we'll that. get there that's part of the renaissance man during that time that i finished with that airport work they made me the chief administrative officer mm -hmm. cao and I asked Jorge, the president, what is a CAO? Is that an acronym for chief administrative officer? Oh, really? And what do they do? Oh, he's a bunch of, he's in charge of a bunch of other acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> HR, <laughs> human resources, IT, information right. technology, quality control, safety, and training. So as part of the training arm, I get asked by one of the brothers, hey, Gino, can you find us a public speaking course? Mm -hmm. And then I found out later, I said, look, one course does not a public speaker make. You have to practice. Yes. So I went to the practice. So I went to South Dade not knowing anything. I had seen Toastmasters in my early career as an engineer, and I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. So I went, and I committed. After three months, I had brought eight new members, most of them from my company I work for. Right. And they voluntold me to be the president. I love that, voluntold. That's yes. one of my favorite words. <laughs> Their word. And I became the president of the club and I accepted the challenge just like I did with yoga teaching because I had to commit to being there every Wednesday at 730. Mm -hmm. That was a commitment. Wake up no matter how you feel. And I presided over all those meetings for a year. And then I was asked to be an area director I was in charge of five clubs. Mm -hmm. So initially it was to find a place for the people of our company to practice to their like public hone in their speaking skills okay. to hone their speaking skills okay. why because contractors among other businesses need to be able to present they have to present to their clients Correct. so what happens to you in corporate america is they're going to say misty you're a great communicator we want you to present and those that can present get noticed and those that get noticed get promoted mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened to me i kept getting more and more higher positions, of course, more money. 
And that's what I recommend to people, that they go check it out. You can go for free as many times as you want. Once you decide to join, it's $45 every six months. So it's very, very affordable. You just have to find a club that's convenient to you as far as time and location. Mm -hmm. Location, not so important these days because they a lot of them are still meeting online. Mm -hmm. Doral Toastmasters meets in person. And we're the most successful club in the district. Right. In South Florida, from the Jupiter Inlet to the Keys, mm. including the Bahamas. Wow. There's 125 clubs and we're number one because we're a meeting in person. That's what public speaking is about, getting in front of yes. 20 or 30 pairs of eyes and you looking at those eyes. Yeah, 100%. I do think there's an element of learning how to speak virtually as well. That's sure. a different skill set. Yes. Because when you're speaking in front of people, just a different vibe versus you're looking in your computer and you can't see people's expressions yeah. and it's hard to interact yeah. with them, right? It seems that people have more struggle when they see people in the audience just staring at them. Absolutely. Right? You think that they are looking at you and that you're naked. Yeah. But the yeah. emperor has no clothes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually doing a talk, a presentation tomorrow <clears throat> on imposter syndrome. And that's a lot of what comes up. I feel like with behind that fear of that, what do I know to speak about this topic? Who really wants to hear mm -hmm. from me? What do I really know enough? They're going to catch your mistakes. Yes. But only exactly. you know if you made a mistake. Exactly. They don't know. Exactly. Exactly. So that's why I love this idea of just crafting that skill because it is a specific skill. Sure, set. sure. And as you can see, and as you have explained to us, it can really take you far. So you're a speaker. Yeah. You're an entrepreneur. Yeah. Right. You're a writer. So tell us a little bit about, I don't know how much time we have left in the show, probably about nine minutes. So tell us a little bit about the book. The inspiration for the book was the story of my life, and it's based on an old Russian proverb that says, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. A smart man learns from his own mistakes. Uh -huh. And a stupid man never learns. <laughs> so I have all these lessons of my life. That I speak about <laughs> being a child and right. growing up and through all the trials and tribulations that I've gone through. I had a brother of mine that was killed, so I went through the five stages of bereavement mm -hmm. there. And in the construction business, I have a lot of humor. So at the end of each chapter, or even in the chapter itself, I condensed whatever that chapter is about into a lesson. So it's a lesson learned. So I have these I 43 it. or 45 lessons that I have in the book I so that you it. can learn from me and be a wise person. I love that. So what's behind the name of the purple squirrel? We haven't got there yet. And oh, I feel like goodness. that's a doozy of an answer. It's a long one. I'll keep it brief. So you heard about my background as a Renaissance man. Correct. And yes. I didn't tell you about being a professor at three universities now. And I was looking for a color for my business when I started my consulting business. Uh -huh. When I went to high school, my colors were purple and white mm -hmm. and I gravitate towards purple. And I looked it up and had these nice connotations of wisdom and creativity and nobility. Identified Crown with it. Chakra. Exactly. <laughs> Crown chakra. You know it. And then at the bottom of the Wikipedia article, there was this term and it said purple squirrel. And I read the meaning. And the meaning was it's a term used by employment recruiters to describe that elusive candidate that meets all the qualifications, experience, and knowledge for a certain job description. The idea is that employers overspecify, making it as hard or as rare as finding a purple squirrel. Oh. I identified with that rareness because of all the things I've done, engineer, right. MBA, developer, burger flipper, house so flipper. you're reading this and you're thinking, but wait, that's me. I that's am the purple me. squirrel. Exactly. And so as part of my branding, I chose the col color purple. You can see that I, I wear purple. Yes. Even, wait, I got to show you my shoes. Well, even your <laughs> shoes. Can we see that? <laughs> the shoes are purple. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I have like a dozen pair of shoes, all Converse high tops, and then I wear purple every day. It's, it's an easy choice if you think about people like Einstein or – or uh, Steve Jobs that always wore the black turtleneck right. or Zuckerberg yeah. wears right. the t-shirt. Yeah. So it's a, it's an easy decision to make on what to wear because men of great power have 
so many decisions to make every day. Why making get What's dressed? Where? Yeah, another, another decision. I agree another with decision. Black a lot just for that. So I identified with that purple squirrel because I think of myself as as a rare person, a mm -hmm. Renaissance man that could do all these things. You know, I can fight with a sword or I can shoot a gun. Right, right, right. <laughs> I love that. So Thank I love you. that you have. Okay, so you have this awesome brand and this awesome book. We only have a few minutes left, but okay. I did. I, I always like to ask our guests. What are some things that you would tell somebody who's an entrepreneur, either new, perhaps they're thinking of becoming an entrepreneur, maybe they're a solopreneur, maybe they're an independent contractor, whatever it might be. What would you say to somebody about, since you have so brilliantly branded yourself, what would you say are a couple first steps that you would suggest to somebody looking to do the same? Well, one of the first, first steps has nothing to do with branding. I took a little seminar by a doctor at FIU okay. in the Honors College. And he said, if you're thinking of starting a business, you need to model it first. Okay. So there's assumptions which become risks and you have to write all those things down and then you do this pro forma to predict the success of your business. If it doesn't predict on paper, it's not gonna work in real life. Mm -hmm. Now you do have to brand yourself initially, right? The name of the company, the colors of your company, which is your card, right. your marketing materials. So choose a color, stick with it, and wear it. And I even have a purple car. So oh, I, wow. I tried. You went all in. I went all in. Purple, everything. It's my brand. People know me. But people know you by this. That's exactly. The point, That's the that point. Even if you have a trouble pronouncing his last name as I did, <laughs> you can definitely say the purple squirrel. <laughs> exactly. And, and I have a story about that, that I'm also a lifetime member of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Uh -huh. The funny part is you don't have to be Hispanic and you don't have to be a professional engineer. It's another nonprofit organization that helps mostly Latinos, but anybody in STEM mm -hmm. To become engineers, mathematicians, whatever in STEM, science, technology, right, right. engineering, and mathematics. Right. And I love this organization because they gave me an opportunity to speak. I'm also on the board of directors of Brinker Education Initiative, which gives scholarships to students in STEM. Didn't you say you're retired? <laughs> <laughs> I would retire. <laughs> Then I unretired and now I'm just damn tired. And now I'm just tired. <laughs> I have a feeling you have a lot ahead of you still. So the thing about the purple squirrel is that people will not remember my name. They will not know how to say my name. Right. But they'll never forget the purple squirrel. Right. So as I walk that conference floor, all of a sudden I hear a shout from the side and it's like, hey, purple squirrel. Uh, and I turn around, funny. I look and people are identifying with me. That's funny. <laughs> I love that. I Thank love you. that so much. Thank you. So, well, congratulations on your book. We're just getting ready to wrap up our show. I can't believe it's already been about 30 minutes. That went by super quickly. I know. Any last words that you would like to leave us with today? Oh, just a big thanks for getting on here and be able to share my knowledge and my voice about the world because that's what I do now. I'm trying to mentor the next generation of leaders. So, Get my so, book, yeah, follow so where me. Where someone get your book at, by the way? Amazon and Kindle. Amazon. And I'm also getting it translated to Spanish because nice. I want to do a book tour in Colombia where I was born. Nice. I want to go to Bogota and Medellin. That's awesome. Well, things are opening back up. So this is a good yeah. time to do all of that. And with all that time on your hands, this should be super <laughs> simple. No problem. Yeah, ma'am. <laughs> so thank you. So if someone oh, wanted to pleasure. get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? If they're my, looking for a mentor iCloud, or more information. Eugenio.jaramillo at iCloud com at iCloud. .com. Yeah. All right. We got that. And we will get that out for you all as well. Well, I want to thank you guys for being here for another Marketing Monday. We have another awesome guest coming up next week. We will see you then. As always, if you have any questions or you'd like to be a guest on the show, please feel free to reach out to me. And I want to thank you for your time again today. My pleasure. Mr. Thank Purple you for Squirrel. having me. We'll just leave it at that. That makes it a lot easier. And that's it. I hope everyone has a blessed, wonderful, safe, healthy, all the good things week. Good vibes only, right? Good vibes good only. Good vibes good only. Karma. Good karma. Good vibes. And with that, we'll leave you. Make it a good one, everyone. See you.